Yora Taito, now my Coyote Man. Welcome everyone. My name is Akira Aksnov and I'm the Partnership Relationship Manager at the Trans I would like to announce the Indigenous themes of this land. They are respect to the elders present in the They hold the memories of the past and the hope. I'm speaking to you today from the land of the Gayamago. And a virtual event with Stephen Worrell. Apologies, my uh, microphone is very soft, so I'll hold it next to my mouth. Stephen Worrell is the Managing Director of Microsoft Australia. The Circle would like to thank our Emerging Leaders Series partner, Accenture. As Managing Director, Stephen is responsible for Microsoft's overall business in Australia. He ensures the company meets the needs of its customers and the more than 11,000 partners and independent software vendors that sell or build on the Microsoft platform. Previous to working at Microsoft, Stephen worked for IBM for 22 years and held a number of marketing sales and general management roles in the services, software and financing segments of the organisation. The discussion today will be moderated by Anne Burns. Anne Burns is Resources Industry Lead, Australia and New Zealand at Accenture. Anne is a 25 year veteran in Accenture and manages a large and diverse business portfolio for products ranging from aviation, consumer products, industrial, all the way through to life sciences. She has worked extensively across many geographies and industry sectors and works closely with executive teams on major transformation programs. She is a member of the Executive Committee of Accenture Australia and New Zealand, and also a member of the Chief Executive Women Australia. To our audience, we ask that you please remain on mute, but keep your videos turned on. You can submit questions through the chat feature, which you'll find on the top left of your toolbar. Following this session, we'll move into break out rooms that you have been invited to. I hope you all enjoyed enjoy the briefing today and please get us started and Ah Ah oh, Are you there? I think we're there. Hooray. I was just having a small moment. <laughs> Well, happy Friday, my goodness me, the, the Friday evening before Melbourne Cup weekend and I'm here in Melbourne, so the end of lockdown, what could possibly go wrong? So uh, really tough to be here today. Thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. You and I are of a very similar vintage, I think, Steve. Uh, I think we're both Sergeant Pepper babies. Is that right? Are we the same vintage? I think so. I think so. We can only just hear you on mute. If you could pop, unpop your mute button, Steve, that's the first test. That would be great. I just failed that test myself, so you're forgiven. Yeah. But I think we're the, I think we're both Sergeant Pepper babies, are we? I think we, you might be right there. So 1968, there you go. Exactly, exactly. That's showing my age. Ladies never meant to reveal. But uh, for those of you who don't know what Sgt. Pepper is, it's yeah. the most amazing, <laughs> amazing album from the Beatles. And there was a legend that many, many babies were conceived as that album was released. So maybe that's a good place to start our chat today, Steve. 
you might have to explain who the Beatles are because you probably have some people who may not know who they are. I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. Well, why don't we start with a bit of a, this is always a little bit of a dangerous experiment. Let's see how we go. Could you take out your phone for me? It's right here, Anne. There you go. And could you go to your photos I and share it. with all these good people, yeah. of which there are now about 43. What is yeah. the last photo on your phone? I'm dreading what this is going to be, but let's hopefully you want to come imagine. right to the screen. You can, you, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I, I, you, you did give me a warning. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a spoiler alert here, but about five minutes ago, Anne said, I'm going to ask you this question. So what's on your phone? And I thought, well, it's the last photo. I so said, I don't know. So I had a quick look. And there are five photos that you may not be able to see at the top right there, but my brother-in-law and his wife have just had uh, their second child. Um, oh. And on WhatsApp, those photos go straight into my gallery. So about two hours ago, they sent me those photos and I hadn't seen them until you just prompted me, Anne. So oh, congratulations nice. to my brother-in-law and his wife. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Great, great, good. The reason I gave you some notice is sometimes I've done this and something inappropriate pops up. So I'm, I'm glad. Well, it's funny. It's, I think it's good good practice because with WhatsApp, they go straight into your into your gallery, and and I have a bunch of friends on WhatsApp who do send me some material from time to time that probably shouldn't be shown on a family <laughs> family uh, television uh, program. So uh, I'm glad you did give me those few minutes notice. Good, 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 good. All right, Steve. Well, let me ask you a couple of rapid fire questions, and then we'll get into some serious stuff. Right. When you were when you were a kid, what did you want to be? An opening bowler for Australia. Is that right? Is that right? Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Sydney and I, I played cricket all through school and university. And then sort of um, as I as I got older and realised that I didn't quite have the talent for it, then uh, that dream sort of faded away. Yeah. And did you always have that kind of level of ambition? Because it seems to me that level of ambition is still there, Steve. Uh, always very competitive. And I love, love sport from, I still do, uh, always love being active and, and competing. Uh, and yeah, in the backyard with my brothers, that was that was my dream. Um, I suspect I'm, I'm not the only one that didn't quite get there because you you do hear that story about cricketers who make it, and then they say that was always my dream. So yeah. sadly, uh, I was one of the many who had that dream and didn't quite get there. Never mind. And where are you in the order of your brothers, youngest or oldest? I'm very much the baby, and I'll tell I can you. I can tell. Happy to tell you that. <laughs> I can tell. My husband's the youngest of eight. There are certain characteristics come with the come with the baby. So if if I said to you, make a documentary, make a documentary, what would that documentary be on? Yeah, I think um, it would be about golden retrievers. Wow. So, uh, I, I have two golden retrievers at home. I, I, um, I, I often say my, I, I love Adrian, my wife. I, I love my, my dogs, my kids and my mates. Maybe not always in that order, but it would be, it would be about golden retrievers, Anne. And what would, what would be the storyline, do you think? Uh, look, I think, you know, man's best friend, of course, but through this period in particular, the last eight months, uh, our, our, um, our two, two dog, both girls, have, uh, they're always a very key part of the family, but uh, even more so. And I think they um, uh, uplift our spirits as a family. I think they connect with, you know, any time we go to the park or wander around, same with other dogs as well, I guess, but they're just a massive part of our, our life and, in, and more so in the last, um, as I say, eight months or so. Uh, and I think a documentary on Golden Retrievers is long overdue. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I have two uh, schnauzers, German schnauzers. They're fantastic little dogs. They're very, very bright. And I think we, we actually can learn a lot from dogs. They're just such joyous creatures. Uh, I have really enjoyed being at home with them, I have to say, after usually my life on the road would be uh, every week I'd be away. So to be at home with my dogs, uh, fortunately, my kids are all away. So that's great. Yep. So uh, I've, I've enjoyed the time. The issue, of course, though, Anne, is because you're at home, they, I'm not sure what whether you've got them into any bad habits, but our, our guys like waking us up in the morning at sort of 5.30 and sleep in the bedroom and, well, all sorts of things that we said would never happen. So we're going to have to break some of those habits. <laughs> yeah, a bit of, bit of separation anxiety when everything goes back to some kind of normal. Well, it'll be for them and for me, I'm sure. When, yeah, yeah. When yeah, exactly. So if there was one skill that you wish you'd mastered apart from bowling, what would that be? Uh, be uh, be a handyman. I'd have to admit, I, for anyone out there that, um, uh, well, again, over the last eight months, there's a lot of time at home, and you've been thinking I should do that or this around the home. 
each time I try to drill a hole or uh, do some sort of home improvement, I invariably end up more doing more damage than I than 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 I should have, and um, I end up calling someone. So I should just acknowledge that I have no talent as a handyman either. There's a reality show in that, Steve. I think it's called Renovation Rescue. I'll send them round. I'll send Channel I, Nine round to your place. It just upsets me watching how you know how people can do that sort of stuff and generally not you know drill a hole through their hand or or do damage. So, um, but maybe <laughs> in another lifetime I'll pick up this. So, last question on the kind of rapid fire: What is your guiltiest pleasure? Yeah, look, a couple of those, but it would prop, the top of the list would be uh, Pinot Noir. I think that's always a challenge on a Friday and a Saturday night to um, just stay with a couple of glasses and not keep going. So Yeah, very good. I couldn't agree more. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do this evening. Very good. So you can see it's already there. It's been yeah, it's, you just planted that in my mind, <laughs> even more than it was already. So, I mean, thinking about what we've just been through in 2020, I mean, I already feel like we're almost at Christmas. Honestly, it's gone so, in some ways, it's gone so quickly, and in other ways, it's been agonisingly slow. What, what has surprised you most about this experience we've been through in 2020, and what have you learned about yourself in this extraordinary time we've been through? Uh, what what surpri surprised me and, and very pleasantly so has been the collectivism and the the bipartisanship and the just pulling together that we've seen across Australia and without um, uh, getting into any any shade of, um, of of politics or any particular party governments across the country have come together and it's not been perfect and by no no means would I suggest that but if you think about our health system you think about our education system um, governments. Uh, you know, I think about my mum is um, in aged care here in Sydney, and I think about the, the company and, the, and the, the workers, the caregivers, the nurses, the people who get, who've get been going through using public transport through the last six months, going to work all day, um, each day to look after my mum and obviously many, many other uh, members of the, of the aged care community around the country. I, yeah, I just think it's one of the things I love about Australia, I guess. It's it's a sense that we're all in this together and you only have to look offshore and there's lots of examples where that same sense of what it means to be together uh, as one community, you can see the impact when that's not, not there. Um, very, very different outcomes. So uh, pleasantly surprised by that. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be surprised because you, that's what it means to be Australian, I think, but it's been awesome to see that in in action, given uh, what we've been through, what 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 have I, I I learned? I think was the second part of the question. Yeah, personally, what have you learned personally? Um, I I think at a professional level, what what I've um, learned or at least tried to to stay focused on is how do I have to uh, change my leadership style and how do I have to evolve so that uh, I can have impacts and that I can. Uh, react accordingly, right? Because as a leader of a business, um, you, you clearly understand things have been turned upside down, but uh, being trying to be thoughtful and reflective about, so how do I need to show up in a different way? How can I uh, adapt so that I can support the team and play my role? Um, and so I think I've learned a lot about how to do that in a digital, increasingly digital world. Um, at, at the same time, you know, would acknowledge there are lots of things that um, still aren't perfect and I'm still trying to grapple with. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, it's a very interesting time, isn't it, where some of the toughest times teach you the most as we think and reflect on your very esteemed career, very long and esteemed career. I mean, what were the formative moments in your career that have shaped your leadership style? And do you agree that it's the toughest times that teach us the most? I agree. It's the, the the most painful moments that stand out. I think you learn you you learn all the time, and and I think I you know the ideal is that you, you in every career at every point you you're always uh, approaching that that situation with an open mind that that says I what am I going to learn from this? And even in the situations where you're either frustrated or you feel like there's there's nothing to learn, forcing yourself to go back and challenge that assumption, but. Uh, for me, it's it's you know pain uh, that that stands out in my memory, and you know you, you shared that question with me in advance, and there were several thoughts uh, that came to mind. But the one I'll I'll share here is a few years ago when I joined Microsoft. I'd, I'd been at IBM for 22 years, and yeah. I think to be fair, I, I might have been suffering from uh, you know being in the same environment for too long. Not, not a comment about IBM, but just 22 years in one organisation. 
I think I had cultural shock when I came into Microsoft and, and I think many people can relate to that as you go from one organization to another. But at that same time, my father was was um, in the last couple of years of his battle with cancer and um, my mother, who I mentioned, um, was just developing the first stages of her dementia. Mm. And without without going through all of the uh, the gory details or the grim details, it was uh, two years uh, just joined the company, trying to um, uh, trying to play my role at Microsoft, learn a new organisation, and obviously um, step into a completely new environment. Uh, and then you know all the demands that uh, my, you know my father one day not long after I joined said um, because it was the cancer was terminal. Uh, Stephen, I'd like to um, die at home, which is a conversation that I'm, I suspect many people on this call may have had with their parents or family members at some stage. And if you haven't, you probably will. It's just a, it's a very normal life event, sadly. Uh, and you know that question came up, and my brothers and I said, "Sure, Dad, of course," as you would, as any dutiful son or daughter would do. I had no clue what that decision and that simple conversation was going to lead to over the next couple of years in then setting up that environment for dad and managing his decline and also mum's dementia. And so um, really painful. I, I, I still feel those the, the, the intensity of the emotion now, right, years later. Uh, and professionally, I think it had a deep impact on me because um, I was not showing up at work particularly well, um, struggling with a new, new gig. Um, feeling like I was not doing all that I needed to do at work, but also knowing that I wasn't doing all the things I needed to do personally. And then, you know, that sense of being overwhelmed and, and failing in, you know, mm. multiple areas. So that pain um, drove a few things, but it, but it certainly um, was a turning point, if you will, in, in regards to growth and I, and I hope um, learnings that I get to and still do apply now. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly known as somebody with enormous empathy. And I think very strong leaders who show vulnerability and empathy are the ones that people just want to follow. They're drawn to those types of leaders. I know you are a very strong advocate for inclusion and diversity and particularly mental health. I know that you recently launched as the founding chair the Corporate Mental Health Alliance. I think you launched on the 13th of October. Tell us a little bit about why that is so important for you and the difference you would like to see that that makes in corporate Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's important to me because that personal experience, for one, you know, I, I, I knew I wasn't showing up very well at work and, and I was so fortunate to be surrounded by some great people here who looked after me. Uh, I might also say that I, I didn't cut myself much slack during that period and, and, and could have made things a whole lot easier by accepting the help that was being freely offered to me. Uh, Pip Marlowe was my, my boss at the time and she couldn't have been couldn't have been more supportive. You know, take the time you need, do what you have to do, look after your family, all the things that I think I probably have said to people over the years uh, in, you know, in other situations. And I couldn't take that advice myself, which is crazy, but, but mm. true. Uh, and so um, I think so, so why is it important? It's important because that's one very common story. I mean, as I say, everyone's got parents and we're all either have had that experience or we'll have something similar, you know, in our lifetimes as we manage our, our, our parents towards the end of their life. Um, as sad as that is, that's just the reality. Uh, and yet that's one of a million experiences that, that might happen in any given day. And, uh, and I, I guess I, I just threw that experience, perhaps if anything, realised that um, you, you really do need to go a little deeper than, than sure, whatever support you need, we're here for you. Uh, and I'm simplifying it, but I think but trying to, if you can, and I know it's, it's always difficult, but really trying to be empathetic and understanding what's happening in someone's life can lead you to a deeper understanding of what the real issues are. And then whether it's personal or professional, put you in a position where you might actually be in a, in a position to help. And so that's why I'm passionate about uh, you know, mental health in a broad context. Uh, and then, you know, um, I, 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 we're not alone, right? I mean, everyone has, has physical and mental health and, and not surprisingly, when I reached out, the idea, we got the idea from the UK and, you know, we saw this organisation, CMHA in the UK and thought, well, we should do that here. And, you know, a set of phone calls, emails uh, uh, later, and it took a little while to get, get, get it up and running, but uh, Matt from CBA, uh, Michael from uh, from uh, Bunnings, Mike Schneider, uh, Steve at Coles, Brad at Woolies, 
the list goes on. You know, and I, every leader I speak to is passionate about this topic for all, all the, the right reasons. And so I hope the Alliance can play a role to, as we, we, we said, to normalise the conversation and that just as much as we might say, you know, Anne, how are you feeling today? You, you know, you, you had that knee operation last week and how's the recovery going? And physical health is something that we can readily talk about. There's no, no stigma, no issues. The same should be the same should be the case for mental health in all its forms and um, that's what we hope to help achieve with the alliance and obviously the many many stakeholders that we want to work with yeah i couldn't agree more i think it's uh it's it's interesting to reflect on the evolution of leadership over the last five years i mean would we have been having the same conversation five years ago about mental health and and corporate yeah. um, awareness of that and the answer to that is no and yet we've seen this evolution and I think what we've been through in this year in particular has raised the importance of that. And that actually, as a leader, it is completely OK to be vulnerable and there should be no stigma attached. And in fact, healthy minds, happy people make very productive people. And I think uh, certainly from a leadership perspective, the, the, the ability to talk about mental health in a very caring and empathetic way and the ability to be vulnerable uh, I think is incredibly important. And I'm excited to see that evolution of leadership. You often talk about being purpose led, Steve. So I'm interested to to uh, extract from you, you know, what your purpose was before this COVID experience and how that's changed after this COVID experience. Do you feel your purpose is the same? Is it different? Has it got stronger? Are you more resolute or or, or is it just the same as it was 12 months ago. What's your thought about your purpose? I think it's definitely stronger. I, I, I think it's hard not to feel more deeply and, and, and stronger about the things that you, you're passionate about, given what we've just been through, because, if we, you know, we throw ourselves back to February, March. There was a period there where we no one really knew what we were heading into. Uh, you know, it, it's been, um, what is it, 80 years or 90 years since the last uh, pandemic. And, and so in living memory, none of us have any experience of what that might have meant. Um, but I think what, what what it means for me, as it does for, for many, many organisations, uh, you know, the many organisations represented here today, it, it's about understanding what your uh, role is beyond j just the, uh, you know, the, the core delivery of financial outcomes. And, uh, I, and I say this with, um, I have this conversation or at least answer this question with a genuine sense of humility because I have been the beneficiary of just about every privilege that you could have. Uh, you know, I, I came from a great family, I grew up in Australia, what a wonderful country, I had a great education, had been given every every access to everything you could possibly want. Uh, my career has just happened to coincide with the longest economic run that any country has ever had. You literally, quite literally, could not uh, design a better, um, a better, better life or at least a better set of opportunities. And so there's a deep sense of, um, uh, or at least I hope, an understanding of that privilege and then a desire to try to uh, give that back in whatever way, shape or form makes sense. Um, my privilege has continued now working for a company like Microsoft, which is very committed to yeah. doing things that matter to the planet and to, um, to, to nations and to communities. Uh, and this is not an ad for Microsoft, but but um, that's a privilege, right? To be in a position like I'm in here, um, uh, I don't, I, I, I won't be in this role forever, and I want to make sure the time that I'm in it that I, I use that privilege and that that opportunity for the greatest impact that I can. And um, and I know that's that's a, a sense that many 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 business leaders share because we are very fortunate to be here at this time in this country uh, with so many things going for us, notwithstanding the challenges that we're facing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I certainly feel the same from an Accenture perspective. So with all of us at home and spending time, uh, tell me what are the three top, let's do books today. What are your three top book recommendations? I was gonna ask you about Netflix, but I think that you never know about Netflix. So what are your book recommendations? Top three book recommendations. Funny, just a quick one on Netflix. Uh, my wife and I have just finished 151 episodes of Blacklist. Can you believe it? Wow. So. Wow. I, I, I don't watch a lot of television, or I didn't until the pandemic, and then we thought, we thought we'll yeah. let's start something, and then we started Blacklist, and 151 episodes later, here we are. So uh, I'm not sure I would do all of that again, but that's <laughs> uh, I, I uh, Books, look, I, 
again, I was reflecting on this. There's so many wonderful books, but I, I picked a couple today that I thought I would share that, that helped me uh, during that period that I mentioned earlier. So perhaps the connection back to yeah. um, dealing with pain and uh, clearing your mind and uh, presumably also, hopefully, focusing your attention so that you can be the very best version of yourself uh, personally and professionally. Uh, and so there's a bit of a theme here, but the, the, the first one is called Buddha's Brain. Uh, written by a guy called Dr. Rick Hansen. It's great. Um, it's been around for 20 years, 15 years. He's written a series of books. Uh, uh, Dr. Psychology, I think his um, major was in, but he's um, in, in, uh, on the west coast of the US and um, fuses what I, in a way that I found really interesting, this, this um, uh, you know, the science of neurology and how our brain works and how, how we react as human beings to pressure and to life's, life's challenges. At the same time, weaving in uh, a spiritual angle with, um, uh, with a consideration of principles that have been taught under the auspice, auspices of Buddhism for, well, generations. Uh, so that would be the, the first one. Second one uh, by an Aussie, um, your, your brain or your mind at work, uh, David, Dr. David Rock, uh, which is a similar theme, but, but, it, but it goes into uh, a little more detail around uh, some of the uh, chemical reactions that uh, might be occurring at any point in time and from a physiology point of view explains how we react, how we process stress and how we, we do the things that we do. Uh, and then, uh, well, a series of other books on, on, on Buddhism. So uh, with, without, without going down that track too deeply, it's for me, um, you know, the ideals of impermanence, the ideals of uh, being in the moment, uh, mindfulness, uh, the power of breath. These are all themes that you'll hear recurring through some of these books have been uh, incredibly useful for me. Very good. Well, I might, before we go to questions, I have one Netflix recommendation for everybody. If you haven't watched the David Attenborough, yeah. uh, it is the documentary. It is just, it's like a roller coaster. The first half is so uh, stark and slightly depressing, but soldier through the first half and get to the second half, which is inspirational. And he has a, a fantastic five point plan. It is not too late. We have a responsibility to do something. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic, fantastic thing to watch over the over this weekend. And that probably is a good segue into questions uh, from the floor. I'd actually like to get a question from Philip Meyer, our chairman of the Trans-Tasman Business Circle. Uh, Philip, are you there? If it could pop you off mute. There we go. There we go. Philip, you have a question for Stephen. Yes, indeed, Stephen. One of the things that, uh, that I've noticed from my various uh, companies uh, as a result of the COVID uh, experience, is that there's there's an underlying unsettledness in the in the executive team that wasn't there before. Some people have called it an underlying um, uh, anxiety. Uh, something appears to be a little bit uh, unsettled in people's minds generally, and it goes to this uh, well-being and and wellness uh, element of mental health that you were talking about. It is, a, it is a spectrum, but uh, a lot of other colleagues of mine have commented in the same way that uh, there is a bit of unsettledness and anxiety that that is around in the community. And for my international contacts, it's even more so than in Australia and New Zealand. Have you got a comment on that? Are you seeing that element of that? Without, without a doubt, um, and be, be uh, interested in other others' comments on it because I think this is a, a really important topic, Philip. The, the no doubt here, uh, but you know, if I just think about uh, what's happening in our business, we've got 1,500 people or thereabouts across the, the country. Um, you know, in uh, Brisbane, in Perth, in uh, Canberra, uh, Adelaide, things have generally been sort of back to I won't say normal, but. Um, close to normal over the last several months with offices being open and people being able to come back. New South Wales has been a soft opening and, and obviously Victoria uh, not, not yet. But, but even, you know, New South Wales has been a soft opening for four weeks and we, we've, we have very few people coming back to the office uh, at this point. I, I think there's no question there's a level of anxiety and stress that, you know, in any given moment prior to the pandemic, it might have been here. That stress level has gone to a new, a new um, 
high tide mark, if you will. And then, yes, around the world, without again, without a doubt, you think about Europe and the US, talking to our colleagues uh, around the world, you know, they're in cities that have been in lockdown, much like Melbourne has been for, for some time. And now, in, in fact, worse, going back into lockdown, which I think psychologically is even harder to, to get your head around because you sort of know now what, what that means, the isolation of being, of being apart. So, uh, yes, it's a massive issue. Um, the Mental Health Alliance, you know, we, we knew it was important last year. You know, the Productivity Commission's impact, they estimate it's $180 billion impact to Australia. We think about it now, after the pandemic, it's it's more important than, than ever. And as I described when we launched it, I, you know, I've been keen, keen for others' input, but I, I think this is the issue of our time, right? How do we, as a collective, recover? And we have to have more focus and effort around uh, mental health in every part of our community. Yeah, yes, I what I've done, if I can just continue on this a little bit, what we've done in um, at, at our boards, uh, I've encouraged people to adopt a culture where we just look out, look out for each other without right. being too intrusive. Just look out for each other a little bit more than we would have done in the pre-COVID times when we were we we weren't quite so looking out for each other. And it's been a very positive thing in the culture of the organisation. Yeah. It's helped the organisation a lot. Uh, we've gone from a, a, a spike up in use of EAP now down to very little use of EAP at all. So it, it's been helpful. Good for you. Great story. Yeah, Stephen, there's a question here from Craig. He's a bit of a troublemaker, so I'll try and uh, he's smiling. I'll try and synthesise this long winded question that Craig, I'm teasing you, but um, uh, you know, you're building upon your comments about team and stress and you know, how are you and Microsoft thinking about the new ways of working, you know, yeah. post pandemic? I mean, you've led the charge on that for so long. I mean, there's such incredible technology. Uh, certainly, I mean, <laughs> we use your technology every single day in every single home in every single uh, environment across the globe. I mean, what are your thoughts about the new ways of working and what's next post pandemic for collaboration and new ways of working? Yeah, I th thanks, Craig. Um, I th look, I think there's two two immediate thoughts. One is, yes, in the platforms that we use, and we're using Teams today, but you, we, everyone has their favourite um, collaboration platform, you know, Zoom, WebEx, Teams, what, whatever it might be. We, we're certainly going to see uh, evolution in these platforms. For us, we, we are um, working on elements that we think will address some of that stress. And, and so a couple of small examples. Uh, we've got mindfulness uh, apps now being built in, Craig, so that there can be, you know, a, a mindfulness break during your day. And so it would just be a prompt that might say, here's an eight minute segment uh, now inserted into your diary for you to just detach from the calls that you seem to have had for the last four hours straight without a break. Uh, and here's a an exercise that might lead you through a meditation or something that will ground you. Now, that won't be everyone's cup of tea, but you get the point that there's services being added to acknowledge that sitting in front of these all day is not 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 something that humans were initially designed to do. Uh, where you know we've also uh, put together a thing called uh, Together Mode, which just has all of the people that might be in this meeting all up on the screen at once. And so, small iterations, but I think that's going to help us move towards a more uh, effective use of technology, acknowledging that, that we'll, we will be using more and more of, of this type of mode of communication. And to be fair, it's also given us lots of positives, right? And so that's that's a that's a good thing. Second thought, I I think I'd, I'd share Craig in response to your question. Back back to Philip's uh, question. You know, I, I've always been a firm believer that it's people first and technology second, and I think that's more true today than at any stage. And you know, what, what else do we need to be thinking about? We need to be thinking about how are we going to connect socially with our teams? Uh, and now that might might not be possible in a lockdown environment, but uh, how do we um, check in on our teams uh, more frequently? Um, how do we ensure that some companies have, have used care packages or have found ways of getting their teams together in a social way that, um, that allows them to sort of connect and uh, de-stress at the same time? And so I think that thought about finding new ways of connecting with each other, just as we have as a community through the last eight months, that I think is the big, that's the big issue for 
uh, leadership because uh, the technology will will continue to evolve and iterate. But I think leaders leaders will stand up and find new ways of connecting with their teams during this period. As we're seeing it, right? It's happening. Yeah, absolutely. We've we've seen this incredible surge globally to the use of technology. I mean, what are, what are your views on how technology is going to accelerate our economic recovery here in Australia and New Zealand? Well, I mean, you, you won't be surprised to hear me say, as the as the leader of Microsoft, that it will play a crucial role. But I I, I don't know that you could mount the alternate argument with any coherence because we 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 see it happening around us that this transformation towards a more digital world was already underway well and truly and this last year has simply accelerated that trend. Uh, equally, I think it's fair to say for us here in Australia, we, we need to be thoughtful about how we want to reposition our economy, how do we want to reshape our workforce. A million people out of work, right, uh, by the end of this year. How do we think about getting them back to work, knowing that uh, in uh, years gone by, our economy has been very focused on, on mining, I've uh, been very focused on uh, on tourism, which is awesome, on education, uh, uh, less so and increasingly less so on manufacturing. What, what do we look towards the future? How do we find industries or how do we think about reshaping our economy so that we can create lots of high paying jobs so that our kids, uh, at least my kids, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pushing, uh, uh, well, as we've established, over 50 years yeah, of age yeah. now. <laughs> uh, my kids have the opportunities that I've enjoyed and that you know uh, all of our kids do. And so if, if before the pandemic, if we weren't thinking about that and there's been a massive debate around productivity and tax reform and how we encourage new industries in the country, it's just become more urgent. And, and I think digital capability, digitizing industries, securing our digital supply chains is front and center for what Australia has to do if, if we aspire and want to continue to provide the economic prosperity that we've enjoyed over the last 30 years. There's a great question in the chat box, and I apologise in advance. My pronunciation of this individual's name will be terrible, so I won't insult you, but maybe you could pop yourself off mute. There's a great question here, uh, which is, you know, this this kind of post-pandemic world, we're going to see a reshaping of the word competition. Mm. And so, you know, what is your perception of the changing nature of partnerships where we're probably going to move from collaboration into co-optition with folks who probably have been seen traditionally as competitors and the world has definitely changed. So the question, which I think is a very interesting one, is do you see an even higher urgency to partner, not just with partners, but also with competitors, particularly around government policies or to help us accelerate the economic recovery? I mean, great question. I'm intrigued with what you're going to say. We, well, no, again, no no question. I, I agree with the, 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 the premise of the question, that is more uh, partnering and um, a more thoughtful examination of what a competitor might be defined as and who you might enter into a partnership, what that, that organisation might look like. A bit back to the last thought around the future of the country we and digital transformation. Uh, we, we recently uh, established a partnership with CSIRO, and, and that is all about uh, how we find solutions to sustainability challenges, uh, how we help create uh, new industries, areas of uh, importance to the country, whether it's managing bushfires or, or other, other topics. But it's the intersection of science and technology that, that I honestly believe presents the opportunity for Australia to create uh, new IP and to create new industries. And so then back to this question, and I think uh, the traditional uh, uh, you know, determination or examination of what a competitor might look like, yes, I think has to be re-examined because um, innovation is uh, all about how you come together with others in your supply chain or in connected supply chains to find a new approach or a new way that uh, breaks ground either by lowering cost or creating a new business model or a, or a new innovation or a new piece of IP, I should say, that drives innovation in, in that area. And uh, you, whether it's in the government space or the private sector, I, I think, in fact, government have made clear that they, they are looking for industry to partner more directly with government now. And I think that sense of collectivism that's helped us through this period, hopefully can propel us through the next period as we do just that. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. Rishi, thank you for uh, thank you for asking that. I thought that was a very interesting question. I really appreciate that. I also, Philip, thank you for your comment in the chat that 50 is the new 40. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's a great comment, a great comment. So there, are there any last questions before we break? Uh, I mean, Steve, that was fantastic to talk today. Thank you so much for being so honest and so open. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I think um, your advocacy around mental health is thoroughly wonderful. I applaud you. And I think everybody on this call today really appreciated your honesty and your openness. What a fantastic leader you are. And uh, we appreciate your time and we wish you a great weekend. Thank you very much. Johnny, thank you. So, uh, Anne, thank you so much. It's Johnny here from The Circle. Thank you for your fabulous moderation. You really got it off on a wonderful footing you know, before a long weekend. Uh, you, you took Stephen on the, on the past, on the dreams, and also on the fragilities of our humanity. And uh, you did a wonderful job moderating. Thank you. And uh, for uh, Sergeant Pepper's Boomer, you did pretty well. Yeah. Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, and to you, thank you so much. You know, this was an amazing session, incredible. Almost everybody stayed on. You know, Emerging Leaders for us is about the life journey, you know, the, of what our life our CEOs go through, and what they learn and what they can share with others. And you've been so incredibly open today. And so you trusted us. You know, with your own past, with your own vulnerabilities and your own history and what you learn from that. And that's really the essence of this series of The Circle. We don't just look at positions of people, we look at the people in the position. And you very much left us with the Steve Worrell story, not just the head of Microsoft Australia and New Zealand. So we thank you so much for your support and for being open with us and trusting us with that. Uh, we have now uh, in the chat session, we have a poll which we undertake for our business sentiment survey, in which we try and track the mood of the room and we'll give you the results in the post event uh, uh, email that you'll receive. And now we'll move into breakout rooms. You should have all received your room link uh, to break out through a little bit of networking, getting to know somebody. If you've learned something new today, it's wonderful. We hope you can develop some new relationships. So if you see anybody online that you want to connect to, please let us know. We're thrilled to make that connection. We can never know enough people. So have a great long weekend in Melbourne. Enjoy. Go to everything you can go to that everybody else will be at. And go for it. And Steve, thank you so much. And we'll join each other in the private room to follow. Thank you again to Accenture. Amazing for everybody for joining us. Bye. Thanks, Johnny.